that same poor man. And so even though great wisdom doesn't have to be in just the hands or the minds of great people, it can be in any common Joe, the reality is that oftentimes the people who possess the greatest wisdom get overlooked while great people, in quotations, are the ones who are promoted as those who are wise. For instance, years ago, I took a young man uh, rough around the edges named Michael Mingi under my wings. And I discipled Michael Mingi. It was like a mother chick and her hens. And he would run and I would just put him under my little wings. And I would teach him the little nuggets of wisdom that God had given me. And then what started happening was I would teach Mingi these sayings, these principles from the Bible. And then people would come to me and they would say to me, you know what Mike Mingi was telling me the other day? It was awesome. And I would think to myself, I said that. I taught that from this swivel stool. I looked you in your two eyes with my one eye and I told you that. And then doggone you, you attributed my wisdom to Michael W. Mingi. And so... I sent him away to plant a church. <laughs> uh, but the reality is, you know, sometimes people who have the wisdom don't always get recognized for said wisdom. And it's just the nature of the beast. And so Solomon says, look, that's the case. Not always are wise people respected for their wisdom. And then I said, verse 16, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. Words of the wise spoken quietly, he goes on to say, should be heard rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. And then he finally ends up with this. Wisdom is better than the weapons of war. So he understands that wisdom can be shared, and again, it is not often heeded or regarded if it's not from a person that has quote-unquote prominence or place in society. Yet if he was going to pick strength, brute strength or power over wisdom, if he had to choose one or the other, he would say, no, I wouldn't pick strength over wisdom, I would pick wisdom over strength. Because, you see, uh, wisdom really is strength. The wisdom of the poor man saved the city from the powerful man. And so for us, it's often that we chase the wrong things in life. That we spend our time chasing things that we think will make us strong, secure in different areas. Financially, relationally, you fill in the blank. But the reality is that wisdom is strength. And yet, you might be in a place like Solomon where you'll think, or like me, where you'll think, I'm never going to get rewarded for wisdom. Mike Mingi's always going to steal my thunder, right? There's always going to be a Mingi out there taking the thing. I'll never get rewarded for my wisdom. And yet, uh, Proverbs 24, 14 says this, wisdom is like honey for you. If you find it, there is a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Now, why is that? Because Proverbs tells us this, that the beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is pure, it's clean, it's beautiful, it's rewarded uh, throughout eternity. And so the truth is that even if wisdom goes unrewarded in this life, it certainly won't in the next and even if wisdom goes unrewarded, it doesn't mean that wisdom is still not powerful. And the person who possesses true wisdom isn't small enough to think they have to be rewarded for sharing it. So in the 10th chapter, we find that he now begins his axioms. And really, it starts in the last half of verse 18 of chapter 9 where he transitions and he says, but one sinner destroys much good. Wisdom is actually better than the weapons of war, but still 
One sinner, he says, destroys much good. And so he starts to talk about the factors of the fool, how a fool's actions do play out. And so fools, just one, destroys much good. And then he tags this thought in our next chapter in the first verse. He said, dead flies putrefy the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor. And he goes on there to say then, uh, so does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and for honor. And so what we realize is that God gives us this ability to be wise, to have knowledge and understanding, and then to put that knowledge and understanding into action as Christians. And yet foolishness, even a little, will discredit a lot of the things that God has done in our life. And especially because we live in a society that loves to cast out uh, proverbially the baby with the bath water. Make one mistake and everything you've done before, we're seeing this played out in front of us across the news. Make one mistake or be accused of one mistake 30 years ago and then cast everything out good about a person. That's a society we live in. But it's not just our society. Solomon understands the danger in folly because he says, look, it's true of the dead fly and the ointment. It'll be true for you and I. And so in, in his day, they had ointment like uh, maybe we have, but in, in differently, they would use uh, ointment, perfumes. Uh, they would use this because they, you know, they had it for medicinal purposes, but largely they would keep ointment around because they took a bath like once a week or maybe once a month. And so you had ointment that was incensed, perfumed, and so you kind of rub that in on your skin after your little sponge bath, and then you'd smell a lot better than you actually uh, were clean. And so you'd walk by and say, hmm, what's that smell? Well, then think about in a day where there weren't mirrors, by the way. Here's no mirrors. If you had a mirror, it was bronze, and you kind of got just the, the outline of a person. Very much looking in a glass darkly. So you're putting on this ointment, and you, you have to be sure you get it rubbed in well. Like, you know, you wouldn't want a big blob hanging off your curly mustache. You wouldn't know this unless someone loved you enough to tell you. And by the way, you found that you really know who your friends are if they'll tell you that or not. All right? So one time, speaking of Mike Mingy, my fly was down the whole service. And when I got done, he said, your fly was down. That would have helped earlier. That would have helped a lot earlier. Like, hey, some kind of your barn doors open earlier, right? So it, your real friends will tell you if you got... So just imagine you're putting on your ointment, and you, but you don't know that you got this ointment that you bought last spring, and you, you know, you're like some of us, we're a little bit like hoarders, and we got ourselves a spot because if the ointment's on sale, we buy 10 jars, right? Or we got a coupon, right? So now we got a bunch... But you were checking it out, sniffing it. That's the kind I want. And a fly got in there. You sealed the top back up. Now the fly dies in the thing, and it putrefies, and it, it taints the, all of the ointment. So you, you get up in the morning. You have no mirror. It's dark, and it is like it is in the morning. You're like, I got to get my ointment on. And you rub this stuff all over you, and you go out. And then instead of the, the smell of life, you've got the smell of death on you. Right? And like, what in the... Who is, and you're, and it's you, you know, the, that, that person is you, it is I. And so uh, a little folly is just like that. We're supposed to be as Christ, uh, the fragrance of life to those who are being saved, but just a little fly in our ointment, a little foolishness in our ointment often discredits much. And that's what Solomon's saying here. He goes on to say, that a, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. And even when a fool walks along the way, he lacks wisdom, and he, and he shows everyone that he's a fool. And so what he's saying here is foolishness is shown in a fool's life. He, a fool, is going to, she, a fool, is going to act foolishly. Uh, now, a fool is going to walk on the left, where in ancient times, if you were right, you were right, 
Left is wrong, right is right in ancient times. And so uh, right was always a sign of prominence. Right was always a sign of strength. Right was always right. And so a fool is going to be and act wrong because he is wrong in his heart. And then he goes on to say in verse 4, If the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post for conciliation pacifies great offenses or heals great offenses. And so if you're in a spot where the person leading you, or in this case, the ruler, and in his day and age, by and large, you would have kings that were kings over city-states. You had very regional rulers. But the idea is if your rulers oppress you, if your boss oppresses you, for the students in here, if your teacher oppresses you, or maybe if you are uh, in a home, if your ruler, your parent oppresses you, or anyone in leadership oppresses you, then what he's saying is it's not best to leave your post, right? Have you, have you ever noticed how when things get hard, our natural reaction is to ask ourselves, was I really supposed to be here? Have you ever noticed that? If things get hard, we typically at some point think, am I really supposed to be doing this? Maybe I should move on. Maybe this is a sign that I'm either not in God's will or this thing is not for me. And then if it gets hard enough, it really starts to alter our thinking. And we can find only uh, bad in the situation and only good in uh, any avenue of escape. But the reality is that if you want to uh, see foolishness put down, the reality is most of the time, and this is general wisdom, if you stay put, stay on your post, you will outlast said foolishness. And I have said this about ministry and about serving the Lord. I feel like nine-tenths of most effective ministry in whatever you're doing is just outlasting your opponents. Just keep living till they leave. You'll eventually irritate the enemies until they all go away. You'll eventually, if you have the Spirit of God in you, Make enough right decisions along the path of life that you'll outlast the ones that are off the road in the ditch making wrong decisions. And have you ever noticed that no matter how sinful people may be and they seem to be above the law, it eventually catches up with them. And so instead of crying and screaming and whining, the reality is stay your post. Be faithful where you're at in the thing that probably right now you've got every uh, reason in your mind to leave. And what you'll find is, shortly, it'll come to pass that this thing has passed. And that God will be using your faithfulness to heal, to be the conciliation that pacifies what? Great offenses. If we leave our post every time it gets hard, then, uh, then we really have left no one there but the ones who are causing all of the foolishness. And so for us in our Christian lives, no matter how that plays out, to stay our post, to be uh, understanding this, that sometimes it being hard isn't the sign of God's disfavor, but being hard is actually the sign of God's favor. And when you're in the right frame of mind and you look at things biblically, you can see that trials are sometimes exactly the sign that you're doing what God wants you to do because the enemy hates it so very much. Now, he says this in verse 5, guess what? There is an evil I have seen under the sun. Again, that's on the earth. That's aside from God. As an error proceeding from the ruler. And he goes on to say, folly is set in great dignity, while the rich sit in a lowly place. I have seen servants on horses, while princes walk on the ground like servants. And so uh, the truth is this that sometimes uh, things are upside down. That's his point again, right? Sometimes you have wisdom and it goes unrewarded. Someone else gets your wisdom, uh, the reward for it. And then other times, you know, you might have a, a prince who in that day, the only people who had horses were princes, rulers. If you had a beast to ride, it was typically a, a donkey, a donkey. It was a donkey. Um, and uh, so... He has seen, he's seen princes walking when servants were on horses. That wouldn't have happened. Things are backwards, right? 
And so often in life, things are upside down. And what he's making the point to say is that fools play favorites. That's the reason we have things upside down is because of sin distorting things and twisting things, fools pre play favorites. Uh, fools promote other fools past people with integrity at workplaces. Uh, fools vote people into office who are fools, you know, sometimes in, in our uh, election system. It just is the case. And uh, not always, but often. And so he's saying, I've seen it be upside down. I've seen it be unfair. And so he goes on to talk about fools. And he says in verse 8, And he who digs a pit as a fool uh, will fall into it. And, and then he says, And whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. Now he, what he's doing here is he's talking about Every day in that day, daily activities, by the way, thank the Lord we don't live in that day because this isn't most of our days, but every day, daily activities become dangerous to fools. Okay, so read this understanding the point. You dig a pit, it should be an easy uh, process, but now you dig the thing, you trip and you fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall, if you're tearing down a wall and you stick your hand in a rock, you're going to be bit by a serpent. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them. You, you drop it on your toe. And he who splits wood uh, may be endangered by it. Because you might get a splinter in your eye or something. You don't wear protective eyewear. And if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But he says wisdom brings success. And then he ends this, you'll notice this section is bookended by then uh, the use of the word serpent. Because up at the top, if you uh, put your hand through a wall, you'll be bitten by a serpent. And then down at the bottom, a serpent in verse 11 may bite when it is not charmed. The babbler is no different. And so if, if you don't watch it, the babbler, it, you know, if he's not... If he's not charmed, watch out, the tongue will bite you, is the idea. Now, all that said, the reality is, again, foolishness makes the daily dangerous because the fool is always going to be really about making life, in general, harder. The fool is going to work harder, not smarter. Have you ever, have you ever had a day like that or a season like that? Years ago, we, had a, uh, uh, we were woodcutting for widows. So we were going out and cutting wood at the Samples Farm for widows. And the first year, it was this miraculous event. It's October. The weather's right. And the best thing about wood cutting for widows was the wood was already cut. We were really wood splitting for widows. And so uh, the best part about wood splitting for widows was that we had these awesome gas-powered wood splitters. And there, w there was this move I had with the handle. It was like this. Wham. And the wood was split. And then someone would stick a piece of wood in there. And I'd go, wham. And the wood was split. I mean, I was a wood splitter. I was like the Paul Bunyan of running the gas-powered wood splitter. It was an amazing thing. And it would just disappear. Other people were setting it in the thing. All I got to do is make sure their fingers are out. Watch this. Wham. That's me with the lever. Wood splitting champion. Next year, I show up for the same very thing. Right? And I show up. And we've got two suspect looking wood splitters. One won't start. We crank on the thing till we've got a like chainsaw elbow. And then we're done. We're like, well, we'll just use the one wood splitter. And so then we proceed because the wood was so green because it laid in the and wet because it laid out. The we are like, well, we gotta do the biggest piece possible. And I used my one move I got. Wham. And bent the ram on the neighbors borrowed wood splitter done we got no more wood splitters except that we have a couple of uh, of of ancient pieces of equipment there that no one had ever seen before called splitting malls and we and we had a 10 pound splitting mall and we had a 20 pound splitting mall and so guys jumped in and they started splitting wood they're taking turns like five wax by this guy and then the next guy grabs it and five wax and somehow I got, I got the splitting mall with wood that had literally been in water since 1923. And I, I swung at this piece of wood, 
and it was as if I wrung out a sponge from the sink. I hit it, and the thing made a dent like this far. And what I did notice, all this water comes splashing out of the top of the piece of wood. And then I drove it into the soft ground. That's the other thing. We didn't have anything hard to split the wood on. Drove it into the soft ground. And I was like, you know what? This is ridiculous. I'm going to split this wood because people were splitting wood. I started, I was, I was swinging with all my strength with this 20 pound split maw. I was, and I was just making, I finally, after six swings, I had this much little dents in the top. It looked like I, I, it just little bitty dents. I was like, ah, oh. and finally I'm just, I'm heaving over this thing and sweat's pouring off of me. And, and we had kind of been paired up with people and uh, you want to know who my partner was? Charles Pritchett. And Charles doesn't talk. And he's sitting there looking at me. And I, I, I can't even hand him the thing. I just, I, just, I just leave it and it kind of stands there. And he grabs that splitting maul. And he took one swing. And he hit the piece of wood. And it flew into so many pieces I had to duck. I was like, ah! <laughs> and, then, and then I realized... The foolish person never swings a splitting mall when Charles Pritchett is there. <laughs> and from that point on, I worked smarter, not harder. I just put the wood up in a like this and stepped back, and then I gathered up the pieces and took them to the pickup truck. <laughs> and so, you know, the reality is that uh, foolishness often does that to us. Now, there's a, there's a, there, there's a backside to this story that that wasn't the end. Because the, the next day I got up and I was like, oh, my gosh, I've never hurt this bad in my whole life. And, and it was up both sides. And, I, and, and finally I couldn't, like day three, I was just, oh, and you, and you get ready to take a breath. And, you're like, oh, oh. And, and then what I realized, this went on for like six weeks. And I'm like, I'm not going to the doctor. <laughs> and then I finally threw my lower back out to the point I couldn't go. And when I went to the doctor, what I found out is not only was my lower back out, but I had ribs out of place. That's what was going on. I had like splitting wood. I had like three ribs on each side out of place. <laughs> Foolishness. <laughs> Fool factors. So after listing all this, <laughs> after listing all this, he says in verse 12, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool shall swallow him up. The words of his mouth uh, begin with foolishness, and the end of his talk is raving madness. A fool also multiplies words. No man knows what it is to be. And who can tell him what will be after him? And so, uh, a fool. Uh, fools, um, in the words of one of the greatest worship bands that ever were assembled, uh, because the, one of them was a reverend, Reverend Run, they said, you talk too much, and then you never shut up. Homeboy, you talk too much. You never shut up. Your mouth is big, size extra large. When you open it, it's my garage. You talk too much. Homeboy, you never shut up. You're the instigator, the orator of the town. You're a talk show host. You should be a clown. I could go on. But then I would be talking too much. Because that's what fools do. And you see, the Bible says that in a multitude of words, uh, sin is not lacking. Now, this is a problem because uh, for me, I often look and I say, by design and calling, I'm going to say a lot of words, which is why the Bible says if you want to be a teacher, you better take a second look at it because there's going to be a, a double judgment for those who get to say so many words on behalf of the Lord. But that said, uh, many of us, are guilty of, of too many words. And uh, the reality is that when we read these things, 
if we if we aren't careful, our first inclination will be, well, then I'm just never going to speak again. But the truth of it is that God made some of us very gregarious. Like what we bring to the table is fun. Uh, it's a sense of humor. And in many ways, it's it's our words. Um, and then God has made others of us more retiring, shy. And, and so while the gregarious person is going to be more likely to say a multitude of words and no doubt be more prone to sin in those multitude of words, the other side of the coin is kind of taking, you know, a little bit of liberty with this passage. The person who is shy and who is retiring is often prone not to say a word when they really should. And they are sometimes the ones that have the most powerful words to say. So I think when you look throughout the Bible and all it has to say about words, you might sum it up like this. For those of us who are prone to say a lot of words, we should probably pray that God will give us less words to say. And for those of us that are prone not to say many words, the reality is a lot of times it's pride in the form of insecurity, which is the worst form of pride because we give it a pass. And we should probably pray that God will give us the courage to say the words that he has given us to say. But in both cases, here's the reality. We want to be able to say the right words in the right way at the right time time because i can say the right words in the right way at the wrong time and they won't be received or they'll be hurtful i can say the right words at the right time in the wrong way they too won't be helpful they can even be hurtful just as hurtful as if i was to say the wrong words at the right time and they probably were even said in the right way or with the right heart. And so what Proverbs tells us is a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. So for us, that is really the challenge. To say the right words at the right time in the, in the right way. Now, in this section, he has a lot to say about rulers. And he says right after this, a fool multiplies his words. In verse 15, the labor of fools wearies them, for they do not uh, even know how to go to the, the city. And so uh, the fools, what you would really see here is the fools miss the obvious. They don't even know the way home is the idea because they're always bound up in themselves. In verse 16, he says, Woe to you, O land, uh, when your king is a child, and your princes feast in the morning. And he goes on to say, Then blessed are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobles, and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. And so here he starts to talk about Fools being leaders and foolish leaders kind of fall into these patterns of folly. Now, they do talk too much. Just look at all the commercials that are on TV right now. They often do miss the obvious. <laughs> They're often saying things that don't pertain to the people they claim to represent. Not always, but often. But then foolish leaders, really, they have... Uh, immaturity as the as the basis for all that they do selfishness the immature person is selfish so in this case he's talking about if you have youth that actually are leading you you you're going to be in trouble because by nature we are selfish as youth and and if you grow in wisdom you know the crown of the wise is a hoary head you've heard that gray hair and the idea is in Scripture that if you make it long enough to have gray hair, you've lived long enough to have some of the immaturity beat out of you. That's generally the idea. It's not that every person who has gray hair is wise, but generally that is the case that 
the person who's walking around with the hoary head is way wiser uh, than the person who has all the energy and is out there holding the placard and is, uh, and is protesting. That's why protest is, is typically left to youth, uh, because they've got a lot of immaturity and lots of uh, strength and very little wisdom. Now, all that said, the immature also typically a party. And so you find this to be the case. The youth are definitely going to party. And, and yet so much of what is like national, for sure, stage political events are really just a big party. And here we find you better not have in your land nobles or leaders who are drunk before noontime. That's not great. Right? I mean, you find somebody that's drinking before noon and they've got a real problem. I told you guys this story before. One time I went floating on the Big River and I, I went and floated down to the bone hole in Deloge. And by the time I took out, it was still just 11 in the morning because I had put in at dawn and my buddy had left a car down at the bone hole. And then my truck was up where we'd put in at Leadwood. And so we were just going to drive up and get my truck and come down and load the canoe. But there were like all these meth heads there at 11 in the morning. And so we did, they were like, Hey, want us to help you with your canoe? I'm like, no, now I don't even want to leave my canoe here. I mean, it's like, Hey, we'll help you load it. That's a nice canoe. I'm like, no, I'd, I'd rather you not help, but just go do some meth. I don't know. Just go away from me. But, uh, so then we were like, well, I don't, I, I don't know what we're going to do. Cause I can't drive. Now we can't take 10 minutes and drive up and get the truck because the canoe will be gone. I mean, they want to help so bad. They're going to load the canoe on their vehicle and drive away. And watching us were these two guys, and they were in like their 40s, maybe early 50s. They, had, they were standing next to a nice Ford pickup, a fairly new one, and, and they were drinking bush beer. And they said to me, they said, hey, I don't understand if you don't want you to leave your canoe down there. You want to leave your buddy here with his car and, and me just give you a ride? We'll give you a ride up to the, to the, to the Leadwood. And I was like, well, well... Uh, how many beers have you had? I mean, it's 11. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, blank, son. What do you take us for, alcoholics? It's 11 in the morning. How many do you think we could have had? So I was like, well, that seems reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> so I got in the back of the pickup, and this dude, like, drops in a drive, hits the gas, does a big fishtail, and as we're doing a, like a 180, I look down and we've just scattered a big pile of bush beer cans next to the wheel. It was the most harrowing three-mile ride I've ever had to Leadwood Access. So if you run on people drinking before noon, they shouldn't be making decisions for you and definitely don't get in the back of the Ford pickup with them. Now, all that said... If they're immature and they're partying, this is often a, a sign of, of foolishness. Um, but the reality is they're, they're doing all this because, verse 18 says, of laziness, the building decays, and through idleness of hands the house leaks. And so people aren't going to do good as a ruler and care about the details, the small things, the infrastructure, uh, if they're partying, if they're immature, because those things go hand in hand with laziness. And a feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry. But money answers everything. So here's the folly of fools in office. They're immature. They party. They're lazy. And they think money is going to money is going to fix everything. So you can always tell the most foolish party. Because they'll want the most of your money to fix everything. So... Uh, he ends with this idea. He says in verse 20, all that he said about fools and all he said about foolish leaders. He then says this, do not curse the king, even in your thought. Don't curse the rich, even in your bedroom. For a bird of the air may carry your voice and a bird in flight may tell the matter. This is where we get the phrase, uh, a little bird told me, right from this verse in Ecclesiastes. And so he says, watch out. Even though we have fools sometimes over us, the idea is outlast them 
Don't try to out uh, complain them. And so his solemn summation is watch what you say even in your bedroom, which is um, uh, the idea is in your most secure spot. Why? Why is this? It's probably not true unless you own a parrot or parakeet, which ones talk. Which everyone says probably wants a cracker. You, you probably won't have a bird actually repeat what you said. But what he's saying here is that wisdom, godly wisdom, goes further than just what you can see on the outside. Godly wisdom comes from where? Well, quickly go with me to James, to a section that you're fairly familiar with, and this is important because James talks about the two types of wisdom, and we've looked at this before in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, but James says, this is a wisdom book, the wisdom book of the New Testament, chapter 3, verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness and in wisdom. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to be godly to be the recipient of the benefits of godly wisdom. Uh, you uh, could read a book like Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And his summation in there is these are godly principles in this book. But you don't have to be godly to actually reap the benefits of the principles. You can just do the principles and reap some benefits. But there is a difference between the origins of godly wisdom and earthly wisdom. And how do you know which wisdom you are buying into, whether you're a believer or not? Yet, if you're a believer, you should really want to know where the wisdom is coming from that you buy into. Here's the thing. He says this, But if you have bitter envy, verse 14, and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom, bitter envy and self-seeking, does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where every envy and self-seeking thing exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. So if your uh, wisdom, if the way your life operates, if your relationships flesh out in envy and backbiting and competition and gossiping, and, and always there's, there's dust in the air and it originates around you, then your wisdom is from uh, the devil. But the wisdom that is from above, now here's the contrast, from heaven is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So which wisdom is your life governed by? Because the fruit will reveal the root. Now, verse 18. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The, the fruit of the righteous is sown in peace by those who make peace. So if you can look at your life and there is peace when you are involved. Primarily, your existence promotes peace. You can't always control those around you, but your existence, for the most part, promotes peace. Then you will know that you are being governed by godly wisdom. And that peace comes from the inside out, which is why in your bedroom... You won't say anything different necessarily than you would say in public as it pertains to the truth about something and the way that you say it. And so wisdom that's from above will impact the inside first and work its way outside. And then it will look the same in private as it does in public. Sensual wisdom will be from the outside in and it will look differently according to the situation because godly wisdom has integrity because the Lord Jesus Christ himself is integrity 
and earthly wisdom lacks integrity, it becomes a chameleon to fit in with whatever group it's with because it's fearful of man. And so, Father God, give us the ability to possess the wisdom of God. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you for Ecclesiastes. We thank you and we praise you for even in his tortured mind, Solomon shares some truth that the Holy Spirit has penned down for us. Father God, we pray for those in this church who are in leadership positions. We pray for, for people as we uh, look at, uh, at all that, that goes on, especially around election time, that you would please allow the, the, the righteous um, to, to be promoted to power. And Lord, we know that righteousness exalts a people and a nation. And so uh, give us righteousness and, and help our wisdom to be from above. Lord, help us to be able to discern the places in our life being governed or, uh, by earthly wisdom, demonic wisdom, sensual wisdom. And, and let us trust you that your wisdom uh, from above is better, that, that purity is better than evil, that peace is better than discord, that, uh, that continuing at our post may be uh, better than running. We pray. We pray for those that are in fights, Lord, uh, that they didn't choose, or maybe even ones that they did uh, for righteousness' sake, that you give them the ability to say right words in the right way and at the right time. And we pray that you'd help us to have grace on one another and encourage one another as we grow in this. In Jesus' name.